When it came to choosing the first person to sit across from on this podcast, it was pretty much a no-brainer. For a show about travel and creativity, gaming and geekhood, masculinity, relationships, and the brain-bending frontiers of psychedelics and spirituality, when I trace back the origins of these interests and obsessions, the paths intersect, leading inevitably to a patient zero. To a man who cuts a profoundly humble figure, to a husband and a father, to a backpacking psychonaut before it was cool, to a trailblazing musician and acclaimed composer, to a barista and bread maker and living encyclopedia of jazz and literature of accordions and beer. And it just so happens that this man I speak of sitting across from me with a grin on his lips and a song in his heart is my cousin and more often than not, my hero. It's also painfully clear which role he'll play in a show called Buddha and the Slut. Ladies and gentlemen, Tobias Tinker. Whoa. <laughs> Well, okay then. Well, I had to do my best. I had to do my best, uh, Jan Gomeshi, before he became like an abuser. <laughs> I wanted to do one of those intros, right? I've Keep always, your hands off me, man. I absolutely will. This is not going to be forced love. No, you thought the yes meant no or no meant yes or something. I have no <laughs> idea what that means. Um, hey, it is so good to be here. We are here in Tobias's place in Berlin. I'm curious because your piano is your jam. You can play men. I joke with people and I'm probably exaggerating. I'm like, yeah, I said, I, I think I said something like he can play 12 instruments well and eight badly. Uh, <laughs> it's it's somewhere in that Some zone. Some would say I play all of them badly. <laughs> That's not I, true. Uh, I have too much respect for people that play any given instrument really well to say that I play many of them well. I think I can say at this point, I, I've been playing piano professionally for long enough that, yeah, that's something that I, I do relatively well. Um, able, I'm able to do it at a professional level fairly consistently, and I haven't been fired from any gigs recently, so I guess I'm doing okay. Um, <laughs> well, I we... also do play trumpet and recently French horn. Accordion. And accordion, and sometimes flute yeah. on stage in professional shows, which isn't to say that I play them at this virtuosic level, but I can, but you I can do what I do on them well enough and reliably enough to put them on stage. And but say, you were capable and something told you, because most of us, I, I think, and this is another reason why I really wanted to talk to you, and we chat about this off mic all the time, so it's easy to translate it over to here. But I think a lot of people are daunted by doing things badly. You know, you've written about that, you know, trying to fight perfection. <laughs> Not a problem right? I have. Yeah, This is the whole thing. You have a certain fearlessness uh, in the sense that you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to try it and see. I'm going to figure it out. You figure stuff out from like, you know, rebuilding pianos and, you know, wiring. So I'm going to learn how to wire in this car stereo. I'm going to learn how to do that. I'm going to learn everything. This is what you do. You have a passion for learning. I've seen it transferred to your child and to everyone around you. It's made me want to be braver and how to learn. When you were a kid, what made you look at the piano or think about music and go, I want to try that. I'm not afraid to be bad at it. I want to try that. So this is a, yeah, this is a, let's unpack this question. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of layers to it. It's easy. It's easy from the outside to see, think that it looks like a linear path where, the, you know, I've just always known this. But of course, from the inside, it was anything but a linear path. It was, it's been bumpy at times. And, and there was a period actually for a long period of time when I traveled, which we will get back to when I stopped yes, playing music entirely. Absolutely. I wasn't playing music at all. I was into photography and, and you know, philosophy. But uh, certainly music has always been with me. And part of that was my mother started both my older brothers when they were probably four or five around the same age uh, on the piano because she played piano and, and actually taught, had some piano students sometimes. And she started them and, and it, it just didn't catch. And they both turned out to be great lovers of music and, and have they played instruments in high school and they're very musical. And, but, they, but they've gone down the science path, they've gone path, down the right? science path. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that too, but Tim and Nick are scientists, full-fledged. Yeah, full-fledged. Full arguably more than I am a musician. But <laughs> they certainly, <laughs> they get more recognition. They've got letters after their names. Um, but nothing is as... Nothing is as one dimensional as it as it seems if you paint it like this. But yeah, you could you could break it down to a binary influence between this very scientific, very logical, very hyper intelligent uh, father figure and eternal energy, and this yeah. very kind of warm, nurturing, artistic 
mother figure. Which is symbolically how they speak about those ways of thinking and the left and right brain thinking, like forever in a day. That 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 logical thinking is very masculine uh, in energy, yeah, and that and that artistic typically thought of as left brain yeah, stuff. Exactly, and, yeah. and and that that uh, creativity, free form, openness, uh, surrendering is part of the the feminine aspect of of our psyches. Yeah, you know, and young all... would go into that. Others would go into. Well, I just think it's broadly really that holds. Well, I mean, that that's what the, the in terms of the brain. I, and I did a lot of research on this for the for the book. The that book I started to yeah. started to write and never finished, but uh, <laughs> broadly cognitive in terms of the cognitive science, as far as I understand it, yeah, that broadly that holds. But of course, our brains are but enormously you, complex. Of things, course, they obviously. are, and that, that's you're really doing a sweeping generalization. But you were given the gifts of parents who mm. almost embodied that. That I find fascinating. Because most of us don't. Most of us have one parent yeah. who might nurture us a little bit artistically, and the other's like in, indifferent. Or it's a single parent household, and maybe they, you know, are like, oh, they're worried about you, and you'll never make money or whatever yeah. else. But you were given the structure. It's interesting. You were given like a structure and discipline and kind of like, you know, logical presence that wanted to deconstruct things from a scientific perspective and understand them. Mm -hmm. So you were given this energy of, I want to, you know, get reductionist on this bitch and open it up and get down to the atomic level and understand how it works, which is usually the scientist's mind, almost any scientist scientist I know or a person who likes to work mm. in those fields. It's like, I just want to understand how it works. How you take apart the engine and put it back together again. Exactly. How, do you, how do molecules, how does biology work? Whatever field they're in, how does physics, how does the universe work? You had that and be free and create, yeah. make stuff to well, have those influences. That's the, really cool. The interesting thing about having that, I mean, and it's, it's, I've never really thought about it. How, how binary, <laughs> how almost caricature that is, but uh, you know that I'm not a huge believer yeah, in astrology, true. but uh, I have all, I am a Libra and I have a pair of scales right there that's that to represent the fact that that's always been a huge part of my life, whether, however you want to read that or, or unpack it, it's, it's, I call him even Steven. <laughs> <laughs> it's balance is, has been, is the symbol of my life. It really, yeah. it always has been. And in balancing those influences, to me, I don't see them as being I don't see a dichotomy. They they feel like the same thing to me up to a point mm -hmm. in that I am, I am not a scientist, but I've done a lot of lay science reading, as you know, and, and I had to kind of, in order to have anything to say at the dinner table with, uh, with, with my biochemist father and my, my geneticist brother and my, my wildlife biologist brother, it was, yeah, in order to, if I wasn't just going to be lost, I, I needed to do a little bit of homework and, and keep, you know. Just hearing to... that set up and imagining the dinner table as, you know, as an only child, you know, yeah, oh. I, had, I had just had the quiet British father who was thinking about sports and work, uh, and I had the control freak mom who was you know uh, the the sister to your dad who i think you know she came from a family with like three strong-minded scientifically mm -hmm. minded and really intelligent driven and and disciplined brothers and she was the only real embodiment of like femininity in some ways her life was probably more like mine yeah, yeah do you know what? quite interesting <laughs> she is and, also and, my godmother That's well, do you know what and remember. and she's artistic in her own right i yeah, think that she absolutely. actually inspired me to write because she was always writing like short stories and was always critical of the fact that i didn't read enough uh, I was reading comic books and watching films and TV. That's always been my jam. Um, and I, it's so strange that I kind of have become a writer in some ways because I, I love language, but I still remember and I flash back and I'm going to tie this again into your childhood. The fact, you know, the joke I've said to you so many times, you're like, you know, why can't you read more like Tobias does? <laughs> you know, do I have to like, you know, promise you money to read or give you a, a bump in allowance or take away your allowance unless you read more books? You knew at a very young age, you know, sure. I have my childhood like, okay, I'll try. Maybe I'm the smartest. Them, I don't know. But what was interesting to me was the fact that, I look back and not only were you drawn to music, but you were drawn to literature. You were drawn to, I think, expressions of art in general because you're the household that really supported that. And so do you see that actually like playing a role? Do you see any parallels between the fact that you were drawn towards the piano, you were drawn towards reading, you were drawn towards painting and visual art um, because of those influences ever present in your home fused with the focused right brain, I want to understand it. Absolutely, uh, and what uh, what I was gonna what I was gonna say about the about the, the the lack of dichotomy between these two influences is that some 
scientists have told me that what that that what makes a good scientist is a combination of, of curiosity and rigor. Mm -hmm. You need the curiosity to to ask questions, even you know, even questions that seem to have answers, but you're not satisfied with the answer. Right. The curiosity to try, to ask the to keep asking questions, but also the rigor to follow through and and not give in to the easy answer to follow through and say, no, that still doesn't seem right. And, and, and really, you know, like, well, yeah. attack it from different angles, yeah, exactly. like be able to keep, be, have the keep, freedom to not be attached to just one result or expect a certain result and be able to step yeah. away and be completely uh, objective. So for me, creativity feels a lot like that. Just kind of witnessing it. You it's, mean. it's it's also it's also about curiosity and rigor. It's also about the curiosity to 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 ask this question that that opens a door, but the rigor to follow it through and see where it leads, and and not just do the first thing that comes off your head and then hold it up and say, "Hi, is this good enough? You know, I, I made this. Is it? Will this do?" Applying critical thinking to the act of creation. Yeah, and and following through, and so that yeah, to me that's what what how I've distilled this binary set of influences into so when i'm i mean i'm a i'm a jazz piano player and that's what i was drawn to and that's what i studied and that's not the only thing that i do and it's not the only influence that i have but it's certainly a big one and jazz is very much like a kind of and music theory generally but jazz particular jazz theory and jazz playing particularly is like a kind of a very specialized applied mathematics but it's with, mathematics meets chaos it's almost like totally. chaos math yeah but what, okay, but what I really That's want to get back to, math. and exactly, but this is the thing that really is, is jazzing me. <laughs> it's, it's jazzing I see me. What you did there. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> he does see what I did there. I do this all the time. Um, when was that moment where kind of the, the, the curve ramped up where you just went, I really not just like this, but want to dive into hmm. it. Well, I, I, I said earlier that that my mother started both my older brothers you know on piano at around the same age as she started me and i was the third and i was like you know seven years along from the first and uh and part of my connection i have to say part of the connection with the piano was pretty much instant mm -hmm. uh, they both kind of were distracted and they weren't into it and they were you know they, they, they were they didn't they didn't they didn't connect they didn't catch in the way that music teachers talk about you you don't learn music you catch it right and i did i just i sat there and i went okay this is what this i like this this is fun and i mean i was i had yeah we'll we'll talk probably about the the big word talent that comes along but i had whatever talent is i had i got enough of it that it was relatively easy for me to do the basic mechanical things about music and i was able to learn hannah from montana the you know my, <laughs> my favorite example of, of the it's the early the first song i can remember learning um and uh, in some music book or other but what i got to do or actually what i wanted to do was just sit and explore and i i have this funny experience now because this is what my my son does now what alexis does is sits at the piano and just kind of explores and finds finds stuff I did this a lot, and for my parents, they didn't really understand what I was doing. They didn't see the connection to anything, but they they saw that I was happy doing it, and mm -hmm. I think they wanted to let me do it. So we had this little trade off that I would have I would do the twenty minutes of practice that was needed to do, play through some scales and some arpeggios and some Hannah from Montana, and then I would get to do what I wanted to do for okay. twenty minutes or okay. maybe a little longer, which was just to explore and find my way around this instrument. And I don't think they had any, even though my mother was a piano player, I don't think they really had any idea what I was doing or why, but they didn't stop me. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Well, uh, it's, well this is this is the thing. So you played, uh, what age did you like really start taking lessons? I mean, and if you're hearing us sipping, we're having we're having beer and we're having uh, some Greek, Greek grappa. grappa, grappa kind of, kind of, yeah, it's pretty damn cool. So we have to uh, warn Sorry you in advance, this will get slurred at some point. Sorry about the gulps. And, 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 um, but okay, so did you do Royal Conservatory? Did you do grades? Yeah, sure. oh, okay, so, so you mean, got right through. After my mother kind of realized that I was into it, mm -hmm. that I'd caught, then I, I, I went to it. There was a music, there was a church up the road, literally a hundred meters not even uh, up the remember road the church a little victoria square united church and in the basement of the united church was a piano and that there i had uh piano lessons with with audrey horner 
Mrs. Horner. <laughs> not Audrey Horn from Twin Peaks, nope. not to be confused Although with Audrey that's Horn an from interesting... Twin Peaks. Wouldn't that be great huh. if she were? <laughs> huh. <laughs> and you'd be the next Angela Bettelamenti working for Lynch's future <laughs> thing because you're naturally born into it. Um, so you had the lessons. How many years? Oh, I don't even know. I mean, through through teenage, through, all the way through my teenage years, I had lessons. Not I, I studied with with Audrey Horner as long as she was able to, and then I kind of was past that. And I, I we got a teacher named Ralph Markham in Richmond Hill, who was also my mother's piano teacher, and he was uh, actually a Glenn Gould competitor at, at one point oh, of, wow. of the same age and vintage, and knew and competed in, in, against Glenn Gould. And he was a wonderful, wonderful teacher, and he kind of was had enough was able to really nurture a little bit more. Uh, but I still, I didn't, <sighs> classical music was not ever, I mean, I still play it sometimes. I still mm-hmm. practice up, you know, my pieces and I occasionally am, am asked to do something for uh, professional purposes. And I, I always say, well, this isn't what I do, but I can, I'll work it up and then I can, I can deliver it. It takes me time to learn these pieces, but well, I can do it. Well, but it's not really my world. Well, it's not your never bag. was, never was ever going to be my world. What I I discovered rock and roll. See, and that's what I wanted to way. get to. Like, in here's here's another thing that like you know we have these paths, and then we have like branches on these paths that eventually like can come back or get pruned. And uh, I have the strong recollection, and we can go over this a little bit. But you were lucky enough to live in this magical little neighborhood, and you had people around you who thought somewhat similarly were into music like you were and you had you know the classic ideal of like a teenage rock band thing yeah. going on we we discovered that we liked to play well i mean they were my childhood friends and yeah. but one of them kind of ed roman who will probably come up later um a huge influence on me and is still an active musician and, and composer and songwriter well let me let me stop you right there like, this is the thing these are the type of friends this guy grew up with now not all of those these are musicians but these are the three i remember the strongest uh ed of course ed roman who yes is uh is an acclaimed award-winning canadian musician uh still rocks it out and uh kind of has this like i don't know i would say like a mix of a bare naked ladies-esque vibe with uh I don't know, like you can almost feel like Rush in some of his stuff. You can almost feel... But also reggae. Also reggae and folk. And yeah, yeah, you can see all these influences and stuff. Um, Then you have Chris Roberts, who is a member of like kind of like the new group of seven uh, as far as like painters are concerned. Drawn on what they call themselves. Drawn on, which is incredible, going off and doing these incredible nature paintings and, you know, of a very extremely high caliber, world-class caliber. Uh, You've got Chris Hines. Right, who's like running a bank? Yeah, <laughs> he's, like, he's like running TD Canada Trust or something or something. CIBC. Like I don't, I don't know. know. This is like this was a hotbed of discipline, success, exploration, all of these things, harnessing creative energy, what have you, amongst your peer group. And then at a period in time, a group of you decided to go, okay, let's just make something. Let's do rock and roll in your teens. This wasn't like yeah. in university. Young, from young teens. Yeah. But it wasn't even, it wasn't even rock and roll. We were also listening to Dr. Demento. We recently, the, uh, the fish head song recently. Fish heads, weird owl, all this great stuff. We were listening to that. So we also got into kind of quirk rock. Our band was called the water lilies. And we, if you hunt it down, you can find some water lily stuff online. Yeah. Well, actually I'd like to, I'd like to, there to be more online because we, we actually never really released our, our, uh, our final, our swan song album. Um, it, it was sadly the swan song because one of those amazing, amazing friends that I had, uh, you know, in, in our band, the Water Lilies, was, was Bane Arnold, uh, who, who passed on some, you know, 10 years ago. Or That's so. right. And uh, so he's, we can never do another Water Lilies record because it wouldn't be the Water Lilies without Bane. Uh, but we did one before, before, he, before he left us and uh, it was pretty cool. So maybe we'll, we'll put some links to that. I think that would be really, really cool. Now, here is where we're going to go off the path a little bit, not just focus on music, though it's all tied to it. But I found when I first started to really explore my creativity, which probably wasn't until a little bit in high school, but that was more like just acting and wanting attention. Um, and I wrote a bit, but again, wanting attention to woo women. You were <laughs> you were really in this like creative crucible with the group. But at the same time, I'd also get I would also get little echoes from you or like little pings or bits of information. This is before, like, we would, you know, you wouldn't do long distance phone calls. We didn't have email. We couldn't stay in constant touch. I would just hear long distance phone calls I, cost money. They cost a lot of money. Like, you know, f- my parents wouldn't let me like call you for five bucks on a Sunday to hear what's going on. So I would just get the updates every six months or three months or whatever it was. And as you're digging into rock, uh, you're also digging into the creative chaos of life experimentation a little bit like i remember 
before you were really getting into rock, uh, another tangent, but when it comes to creativity, like you introduced me to D and D to Dungeons and Dragons, uh, uh-huh. which is, which is amazing. <laughs> he would come to my place and visit and he would DM just solo campaigns with me. And I would, I was not only enjoying being led through caverns and he's trying to nudge me towards finding fireball spells and all this other like cool stuff. And he would create names just on the fly. I would sit there and watch not only what I was doing and enjoy it, but I also watch and witness your on-the-fly creativity, your jazz storytelling. Um, and what I saw in that, especially when campaigns would get scary, because sometimes you were a really scary storyteller way back then. I remember it now, and I look back, and it's strange, because I'm like, you know, this is one of the lightest, most balanced, Libran sort of people I know <laughs> in my life. But you also had a bit of a dark slide when you were younger, too. Like just a little bit when it came to maybe some indulgences, yeah, maybe a little. Sure. That's that. So that's the whole thing. And I think that's something that we all have to confront in ourselves. You went. You were lucky, and this is. I'm not trying to bring this up to make you look bad. You were lucky because I think you went through it when you were supposed to. I think we're supposed to confront our shadow selves when we're much younger versus repress, 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 repress. Midlife breakdown. Yeah. You're not going to have the midlife breakdown. Well, it's I had not a pretty gonna... big slide. Yeah, I had a slide that was related to a bunch of different things was certainly part of it was related to yeah uh random teenage uh, hey, rebellion man, exploration yeah we grew up in the country and and there wasn't that much to do and so and and you know someone's parents had a liquor cabinet and and you get you you know you, you start exploring you start you want to rebel a little bit you want to do this well that's when i'll say like Cheers to a little cheers, bit of teen. We're gonna check the glasses, but cheers to teenage rebellion. Hmm. But that's the thing. It was it was really repressed in my household, and it was like, a, oh, I heard Tobias is drinking, or he got blackout drunk, or something. <laughs> and it's a horror story back then when you're a kid in the '70s or like the '80s. See, I thought my parents were totally fooled. <laughs> no, no, they weren't fooled. But this is I I I. Well, you do though, right? You think you think you think you fool your parents. But I I applaud it. I applaud it now because I think that you really got to test your boundaries back then. Well, they left me alone in in this house in the country for months at a time, and and I don't know. We had legendary parties. There were legendary mom, dad. There were legendary <laughs> epic parties at our house. I What's know great this about is having not a... news to you, but I'm just telling you now. There were they were actually kind of epic. What's great about having parties. a house that is lived in, and that's a polite way of saying it's a bit of a mess at times, and, and you know, a lot of kids under the roof. Yeah. What's great about that is if you have a party, unless it's really, really obvious with beer cans thrown everywhere and whatever else, and like the smell of piss in the carpets, they're probably not going to notice as much as someone like my mom who like you know measures the dust line. Yeah, but we like set up a pyramid of beer bottles on the kitchen wall and dug up the bowling ball from the basement and we're bowling for beer bottles in the kitchen and <laughs> you know I my didn't know that Chris one. Roberts tried to glue a watermelon to the wall and it didn't work obviously I Unders- mean yeah. understandably well he know. was using honey uh, yeah okay so okay so <laughs> sometimes or, or he he made a pitcher full of milk and bread and, and raisins and whatever else he found and, and washed it up and then hid it in the back of some kitchen cupboard and then my mother discovered it like a month and a half later when it was turned into a science fiction set oh that's brilliant um see but that's the ty- that type of thinking is you know you start with the gateway drug of of, of booze uh, and that type of like random fun jackassery uh, where you're kind of like, yeah, again, learning your boundaries, you're meeting girls, you're playing a bit of rock and roll, you're doing crazy things, you're getting really, really way too wasted. Then you tell the stories of getting wasted. It's something we did in small town Ontario back then. Oh, I got so wasted, you know. That's just what happens. No matter how erudite and high minded you might be, oh, I got totally wasted, raised it on, eh, give her. We, we gave her. You definitely gave her. I waited until university. You got it out of your system early. Um, well, to a degree. But also you've shared with me, which uh, this podcast is going to be a lot about, you also share with me that you were uh, you were a brave uh, adventurer in the realms of, you know, psychedelics yeah. early on. I mean, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about I'm trying to find a through line for this conversation, yeah. but you're ta- I'm looking at creativity. Yeah, I'm looking at taking risks. I'm looking at exploration and trying to understand things, which if you see the connective thread goes from, you know, music and art into self-experimentation, you know, knowing your own boundaries, drinking and drugs, what have you, and then into travel, right? Yeah. And all these things kind of feed into each other in some really interesting way. Absolutely. And, and so, so I'm like kind of like seeing this journey kind of play out. So we're in your teens right now, and you're starting to go, well, what's that like? 
I mean, I, I want to be careful not to paint this as a uh, as if that as if I had this all mapped out and planned out well, and, of course and perfectly you, in control. But you didn't just like jazz. If you're just like <laughs> jazz. You don't. You might have a, a a sense of structure and you know how to play the notes. I was kind of out of control for a while. So but I mean, when jazz. I dropped out, of, I, I kind of dropped out of high school. I decided not. I mean, I I literally I deliberately did things that nobody wanted me to do. I mean, I was a I was a good student. I was in some ways a very good student and and everything was uh, you know mapped out for me and I made a choice at a certain point in my life that I was like I everything seemed very mapped out that I would go to some the, you know I I could see this path laid out in front of me and I kind of realized that none of the decisions about that path none of the choices about that path had really been made by me and I kind of consciously in a fairly dark period of my life but I consciously my major act of rebellion was not against my parents. It was it was against that. It was against feeling that the societal and overall expectation of this was, is your path yeah, for you. And I was a good student, so I was going to go to a good uh, a good university. And and, and you went to a good university and for later, how long? Later, well, yeah, much for sure. later. I took a long time off. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> did, did you travel before you yes. or afterwards? Yeah. See, I thought there was a, a blend where you traveled on either side of it. No, nope. uh, so I thought, okay, no. so you, you did the traveling. I first. dropped out of uni- see, I dropped out of high school, dude. I didn't finish high school properly. See, I decided to make the only decision that I could make that nobody else wanted me to make. And nobody did this in 1988 or 89. <laughs> Or the late well, 80s. Some people did, but well, they, somebody did, but most of up, them didn't end up doing very well. No, no, they ended. They, you know, <laughs> I'm they, lucky I pulled out of it at some point. They, but. they ended up as as Randall so lovingly said in Clerks, being jizz moppers in porn yeah. booths. Like <laughs> most of the, that's what happened. But but you again forged your own path. But but the first thing that I did was worked on a, a, the night shift on, a, on an assembly line making telephone books. So it wasn't immediately evident that this was a great decision. But you saved up your money from that to travel. Uh, well, no, I saved up my money. Actually, I only did that for a few weeks. And then my okay. elder brother, Tim, rescued me and said, what are you doing? What have you got to lose? Come out tree planting with me. So oh, I, went right, out, I went out to, years, I went out to British Columbia. And this was the first time plant. you really went anywhere, yeah, correct? I had never been anywhere. I mean, yeah. except Nova Scotia. Right, right. But, 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 but on my own. But when you're on Ontario the first time I've been Coast, on an airplane. Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd never see. been on an airplane. And how old were you? 17, 18? 18. Yeah. Yeah, my first airplane ride was 18 as yeah. well. That's really interesting. And so and my son's you, first airplane ride was when he was three months. So there you this go. This is how much things have changed, yeah. uh, not just for the cost, but just for like the, the fearlessness of exploration. But you went out and you went out into the wild, you know, literally, and were like trying to set daily tree planting records. <laughs> I remember well, those stories. Yeah, well, uh, the first year you don't uh, set records and you don't make that much. But I, I did make enough and I met someone who had traveled. The biggest thing that happened to me, well, uh, uh, there was a perfect storm of events. One, I uh, had decided I wanted to go to McGill University to study jazz. Yes, and that's and, our, that's like one of our Ivy League schools. If you're listening outside of Canada, McGill is one of the big three. It's they McGill, call it the Harvard of the North. Ex- exactly. You've got McGill, you've got Dalhousie, and you've got University yeah. of Toronto, and yeah. that's like the Harvard, Princeton, Yale of Canada. And so for jazz piano, for for McGill's for, the shit. For, it's the best program for jazz studies at the time. I don't know. Maybe things have changed now, but at that time, there was no question. McGill was the best school to go to for jazz mm-hmm. in Canada. So I wanted to go there and I'd done an audition and I felt the audition had done, had gone pretty well. So I was pretty confident. So I was out tree planting, making money to go to McGill and study jazz, which was follow, follow the stream. So two things happened while I was tree planting. One, I met this guy who had just come back from traveling in India and Nepal. Mm-hmm. And he, in a very kind of gentle way without you know bombastically plowing it down my throat he kind of just inspired he just kind of told me about gave me some images about what about, about travel about about being in what's that, it, just uh, what's in, it like what's the, it like being, he, being yeah. in, the, in the himalayas what you know on a, on a misty morning with the mist receding over the foothills of the himalayas and and drinking chai at the chai stand and and there's just this this vibe and this and and i had this realization i'd never been anywhere and i'd never done anything like this and this was alien and mysterious and and fascinating to me. And I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that happened was that I was on the phone. I was in some small town in the northern British Columbia in, you know, my tree tree planting rags. uh, Covered in mud. Smelling 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 of uh, smelling of of, of sweat and grunge and patchouli oil. And and I'm on the phone with my mother back in Ontario. And she said, well, there's a letter here from McGill University. Should I open it? And I say, yeah. And she says, okay. It looks like you haven't been accepted. And I paused a beat and I swallowed and I said, 
Okay, well, I think I'm going to go to Nepal. Wow. What I'm getting from you is you got the news and went, okay, I'm going to accept that and I'm going to do this instead. I think what happened was that actually secretly I was pretty into the idea of, of going, going to, to Nepal. Nepal. <laughs> I, at that point, I was more connected to that through talking with this guy who had kind of influenced me. I was more connected with that idea. And so I won't say it was a relief because I was also into, I also definitely did want to go and study jazz at, at McGill and, and which I later ended up doing. But at the, at the time, I don't know if the time was right. And, and the time, I think, in retrospect, I mean, hindsight's 2020 and, and who knows what was right or if anything is right or wrong. But at the time, it seemed it wasn't so much a consolation prize. It was like, oh, I get to go to Nepal. And, and here's something here's something for listeners out there, because I think the, a lot more people are travelers now. Of course, you know, part of this podcast is to talk about being a digital nomad. And it's it's possible now with the wired world and how connected we are to go almost anywhere and at least have an Internet connection and a bank machine and to do whatever. But <laughs> but but it's true. But in in the late 80s, the only thing Canadians ever did that you ever heard of them doing were either doing a summer in Europe yeah. or maybe going over for six months to Australia. That's the only travel that Canadians did. And maybe down to Mexico, you know, or Hawaii. <laughs> but, I had never been in, and I still haven't and been to Mexico or Hawaii. But he hadn't been anywhere. But but going into, you know, remote third world Asia, essentially, before there was a network really in place for anything but the hardiest of travelers. And you were just like, okay, I'll do that. Well, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing at all. <laughs> and you couldn't was, go on the internet to I'm find gonna, out. And you couldn't. You, you couldn't, couldn't do at that. All. There was no internet. There was no, there were no mobile phones. I, there, there was no email. I had, when I was traveling the, that time, there were aerograms. There was post restant. They would, uh, if someone wanted to send you a letter, you would say, I think I'm going to be in, in Varanasi sometime in two or three months. You could send a letter to post restant there and, and hopefully I'll pick it up. That's crazy. That was what, that was what travel was like then. And it wasn't so uh, not done. I mean, there was there was a network of, of facilities for, for Asian backpackers at the time, but you had, definitely had to be ready to face some difficulty that I think would probably daunt some young travelers now. And I was 19, and I got on a plane to Bangkok with a mostly empty backpack and no idea what I was doing uh, in 1989, or 1990, at 19 years of age, and kind of, I mean, the first place I went was Koh Samui. <laughs> I went to Bangkok, and then I went to Koh Samui. And at Koh Samui, on Koh Samui, at first I was like, oh my God, I've, I've, I've messed up. I've made a terrible mistake. I'm lonely. I'm lost. I'm, I'm half a world away from, from anyone I've ever known. And this is, a, I mean... I had, I was still a child in so I know, many ways. And this is almost 30 years ago. Yeah. And when you're talking about, when you're talking about the, the Thai islands then, Koh Samui and Koh Phangan, it's a completely different world. It's not like it's... It was kind of seedy. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty seedy. It was more than a little seedy. That was the place where you went to have the darker yeah. experience of Asia. It is now, but it's still, it's packaged to there be were, slick. There were people there having dark experiences. I, I yeah. was have, only having a lonely experience, but luckily I, I met somebody again who kind of inspired me with, with tales of travel with, with kind of saying, yeah, just, you know, don't, don't pan, don't freak out, dude. Just, just kind of here, go, you know, go to, go to this place and, and, and it's going to be okay. Just relax. And I, and well, so long story short, because I really want to get back into the creativity thing, and we are going to talk about some of the travel, and we'll probably do another podcast and talk more about travel in detail. But I remember, I still remember this, it stuck with me, and it was an important thing. It was a formative thing for me when thinking about the impact that travel could have. Um, somehow you ended up on a mountaintop in Nepal on acid, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Was, oh, it watching yes. a, was it watching a sunrise you or a sunset? Re, you may remember it better than I do. Yeah. And, and uh, he's going to pop open a beer here. Here we go. And uh, see, lovely. That's a podcast. Uh, that's a podcast. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> um, and so when you told me that story. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, here it is. He's pouring it. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I'm sure we're spiking. It doesn't matter. I don't care. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, you ended up having that experience of being in this mystical place on a psychedelic looking out at the vast ranges and i think it was sunrise uh um you had climbed up just before sunrise and done it 
Uh, actually, it was before sun. Yeah, you wouldn't want to be up there before sunrise because you'd freeze to death. Uh, it was before. It was after sunset before moonrise. Mm. Before moonrise. This was okay, okay. So I'm going to set the scene. Okay. I had not done a lot of deep exploration at this point. This mm-hmm. is before my my later kind of yeah. ex- psychonaut kind of mm-hmm. deep deep trials, but uh, I had experimented with psychedelics in, in in my late teens, as you know. And it had been pretty interesting, and I'd had it was a, it was enlightening and, and informative in the ways that it is. But I'd never really gone deep, uh, and I was clambering around on the on the base of a mountain in Nepal, uh, near Mount Everest Base Camp, mm-hmm. and I met this American guy, this guy from San Francisco, who I'd, I'd met in one of the rest houses along the way, and I, I, I was on my way up the up to uh, Kalapatar to get a view of Mount Everest. And I ran into this guy and I, and he looked a little confused and he's, and I said, Hey man, how are you doing? Are you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite fine considering I accidentally, I accidentally dropped twice as much acid as I thought I was dropping. Oh Jesus. And, uh, and I said, acid, you have acid here. (laughs) And he said, yeah, I brought it in my sock. You want some? So I said, yeah, I wouldn't mind. So then I, I, I think I sock. was. I think I was alone. I don't. I think you I said did this you were alone. alone. You told me you were alone. I think yeah. I did this alone. I, I I took what he gave me, and I went up to uh, actually Gokio Kalapatar, which is a different uh, different place, also with a view of Mount Everest. Actually, from Gokio Kalapatar, you can see four of the ten highest mountains in the world. You can wow. see Everest, Chooyu, uh, Kumbu. I think it's not Kumbu. Kumbu is the glacier. Anyway, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, and I watched sunset and full moon rise over this incredible mountainscape on acid. And then I realized that I was extremely cold and it was time to go down. But it was in the meantime. Yeah, it was know. it was what you told me at the peak of your experience, at the zenith of your experience uh, doing that. And it, it sounds almost cliche now because, you know, you have the whole world spouting fucking Hallmark and Lightenisms of, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, this too shall pass and blah, blah, blah. It's almost become cliche, the Eckhart Tolle-isms. Mm. But um, I remember you saying to me then how impactful that was. You said, I realized at the depth of it, at the heart of it, that I could die now and be completely okay with that that you were in a place where you had such satisfaction of being connected in that moment and aware of yourself and all things around you that you could let go. Yeah, I'll have a little bit more of that. I mean, I didn't want to. No, you no, no, you're not saying you were like were looking lots, to die. There but were I'm lots saying of that, things that I still wanted to do. But, but you had I, peace What in I that did moment. realize was that I had, I had imagined doing this thing, going to Mount Everest Base mm-hmm. Camp, uh, going to a mountaintop, climbing a mountaintop, having that experience, and... Somehow, through crazy blind luck and kind of bumbling, you know, bumbling along with no idea what I was doing, somehow I had managed to achieve this thing, which was seemed incredibly unlikely for this small town Ontario boy, yeah. you know, who grew up in a little little farming town north of, northeast of Toronto, to find myself there having this extraordinary experience. Yeah, I was like, hey, I mean, I, I felt like it would be okay. It would be, I, I could accept it. And I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't feel like I'd wasted my life. I would feel like, wow, I did a, I did a pretty neat thing. That's how it ends. Okay, I can work with that. And that feeling, and I talked about uh, that, that feeling became a kind of a spiritual exercise for me mm-hmm. for a little while where I realized that I wanted to keep that close. I wanted to be able to find that when I needed it. If I were in a low moment, if I were in a, I would do it reflexively many times a day, several times a day anyway. That's, that's, I, and that's what mindfulness is. Yeah, when I, they talk about being in the zone experience, that's having, you know, being in the moment. It was a little micro, now. it was like a little micro meditation. Of course it is. To, to try and to, you know, walking down the street or sitting on the bus or whatever I was doing, I would, I would sort of go, Hey, imagine 
something happening. Imagine this bus crashes or flips over. Imagine whatever. I don't, not graphically, but but just imagine something happens. There aren't and, limbs flying yeah. everywhere. There aren't zombies breaking and eating be. people's, you know, pancreases. <laughs> but look, really, it's bad shit happened. And can I can I accept that some bad shit just went down? If it were to happen, if something, if this were the end, if if it if this were all I got, if this were all the life I got up till now, can I get to a point in myself right now where I say, yes, I'm okay with it. I feel I feel good about what I managed to do in this life. I'm not looking to check out. I'm not bored or done. Mm-hmm. It's not that there isn't anything else I want to do. It's that. But can you accept the can moment? I accept that this moment, if it were the last, and I would work at it until I could say, yeah, I'm good. And I, uh, this is a funny, I mean, we've both read our Castaneda, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and Castaneda is very... That's, that's Carlos, not not Joan or Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we have to parse Castaneda now? <laughs> Holy smokes. Um, uh, there was a time when Castan- when when we didn't. Then uh, it's very dated and very in yeah. some ways very cliche and, and and all of these things but there's something there there's a germ of something there and and one of the things that don juan talks about mm-hmm. in those books is keeping death close yeah at arm's length keeping death always here close to you because it's important and it gives a framework for for life it's it's something that i encountered later and we talked about during one of our smoking sessions or something that we we had one of our long talks about life and death and and how to embrace that experience as i slowly started to grow spiritually again i bring up this moment in nepal because i think that that was the first seed for me like and so much else like with travel and create creativity and what have you for me that was the first seed of going i knew even though i didn't quite understand i couldn't grasp the language of spirituality at the time because i was really ego driven then not at all now but i really was then um but i knew in what you had said i knew there was a magic in it i knew there was something magic and as we're talking now it's like well duh he's talking about being in the moment and accepting the moment for what it is and not being attached to outcomes and that releases suffering and allows you to have a a, a moment of enlightenment and bliss experience but um talking about keeping death close it, i really during my crazed video game days and getting into like a little bit in the japanese culture with you know mm-hmm. the the big game studios there and some of the things that they made um and Bushido code and and mm-hmm. the samurai code of going you know each day you have to take time to sit basically go into a meditative state and imagine all the different ways you could die you could be gored by a sword you could be like killed by a wild boar you could be you know eaten by an insane woman you could be you know whatever would happen but you had to imagine them and just like smile and embrace all of them keep death close as yeah. your friend and that way you won't freeze in a moment of action and that's pretty cool somehow i i i discovered this on my own on your own in a weird way mm-hmm that's that was what it was that was what travel travel gave me a lot that that particular travel and and i was you know backpacking around in asia for Mm -hmm. for six months and lots of things happened um there was a there was a it was kind of a watershed in in, but this wasn't the watershed out of your ass moment of being with the thanacea being on the train in india well it wasn't a thanacea it was uh, an earlier girlfriend oh earlier girlfriend were you but was it during that trip or no oh yeah okay okay so see the end of that so he see here's here's the interesting thing i'm going to bring this up only because i've had a few experiences like this but his nice but 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 yours um for me hearing it from you and you're laughing and we're smoking a joint and i'm just going oh my god you know me hyper empathetic and i'm like feeling it i'm feeling every gurgle out of your butt which is really sick to say but it's a hear, special image but 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 yeah but but here's here's the thing i've had a few experiences like that sense of being sick uh overseas Very sick. And, and extremely sick where you honestly think a part of you you just went from saying you know what i could let go right now if i were to die right now everything would be fine i'd be okay with it and then all of a sudden the universe goes well okay i came really fucking close how do you feel right now yeah. <laughs> can you keep calm i came really really what really did that close. feel like in the span of that six months of going from this this zenith to this nadir of being on a train was it dharamsala like where were you you were well okay <laughs> condensed version but condensed uh, version i was in southern india uh on kovalam beach okay. near trivandrum and uh i was leaving because my girlfriend at then girlfriend had to go back to Canada because her mother was having a nervous breakdown and everything was falling apart. So we had to go back up to Delhi so she could fly home. Okay. And the last meal that I had, and she didn't have it, I went off on my own and I had, the last meal that I had was, was served on a banana leaf. Uh, and yes. I watched them brush the banana, you know, wash the banana leaf with water. And I had this thought, oh, 
Should I trust that? But I was in this traveling mode of, you know, whatever. I'm going to embrace eat the food. experience. I'm going to eat street experience. food. I'm going to eat everything. I'm not going to be I'm not going to be terrified of everything. So I ate it, and within a few hours of getting on the train, I became aware that I was sicker than just a little sick, and that proceeded to be a three day train trip uh, from southern the bottom tip of India up to up to New Delhi, sixty three hours, I think. Bottom and tip. I spent almost the whole time uh, crouched in the corner of the train with the hole that serves for a toilet with the tracks running by underneath me. Hence me you. saying bottom tip. Yeah. I don't know why. And, right. <laughs> and uh, passing most of, passing half my digestive tract out through all possible holes. It was pretty intense. It was bacterial dysentery. Yeah. Um, and by the time I got to New Delhi, I dropped off my then girlfriend at the, uh, at the, airport and went straight to the east west medical clinic the the hospital that i felt i could trust at the time and they just threw everything i later found a a, a slip of paper with all the list of everything that they they did to me because i i lost i had no memory I, so they I, threw the whole host of antibiotics at you and and there's a there's a several day period that i had no memory of at all i i don't know what happened but somehow I spent a week convalescing after that in New Delhi, carrying around my bag of bananas and my electrolyte water and, and trying to, you know, recover. And then I decided in the middle of the night, I decided I should go to Dharamsala, which is where the Dalai Lama lived yeah. at the time. And I decided I wanted to go there. That was important to me. So I went to the bus station and, and I got, uh, got on a bus and I had this weird kind of middle of the night overnight bus trip through the Punjab arriving uh, on the way up to Dharam Salah, which is this kind of gritty shitty hill mm -hmm. town in the northern India mm -hmm. and I as dawn broke and we're going up through the foothills of, of the Himalayas I became convinced profoundly convinced that I had died and that I was on the Bardo. I was in the Bardo. I was on the journey between lives. Interesting. I, I was for, on, for those of you who don't know, you should read your Tibetan Buddhism Tibetan and take Book a look the at the, yeah. the Bardo. Yeah, and yeah, Tibetan Book of the Dead. And, uh, you know, the Bardo, the realm that takes place after you die as you travel through and kind of reconcile aspects of your previous life with karma you've held over from other previous lives um, in the process of burning away shit and then preparing to re-enter life because chances are overwhelmingly that you're going to have to come back and you can't get off the wheel of life and death. Yep. Um, and so he's like, okay, I guess uh, right now I'm spinning on the wheel through the Bardo, and where's my next body to jump into? I'm going that, through all these experiences. That's what that's what you felt. I was I was I, I was as convinced as, of this as anything I've ever been in my life. <laughs> been I there. was I was been there. deep down this journey, and I was just sitting there in this bus seat as we you know barreled through these these little hill time hill hill town markets as dawn broke over this in this beautiful thing and i just sat there and i was like wow this is that's okay i guess this is this is what's happening and i'm on the way to the next thing i really i really believe this yeah and then i was unceremoniously the bus came to the end and i was dumped out into this bus station in this gritty hill town in dharamsala and i found my way up to the to macogdanj which is where the the tibetan government in exile without getting pickpocketed and without having a parent bring his daughter to you and offer you a wife amazingly i did not get anything stolen on that trip i don't know what happened it was incredible i had that yeah. my my, my travel Steven, philosophy folks. my travel philosophy was a little paranoia goes a long way yeah which i words to live by um and then I spent a month in in the foot in in McLeod Gange living in you know and kind of just soaking that in uh which was transformative as well well I think way. that I think that and this is the thing we're getting close to the end of your journey right or relatively of that journey of yeah. that journey <laughs> yes exactly of that journey um and that really informed your next stage of creativity in a big way Absolutely. Right? Uh, well, it became Passage. Yes. It became this album. Now, now, for those of you who don't know Passage, this is, um, you know, would you call it a seminal album? I guess you would, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, and it's, it's, it's a mix of, of world influences and emotional and spiritual threads and these kind of sonic scapes that are, uh, are so beautifully representative of your travels and of what you're feeling in your travels and what you encountered and experienced outside of yourself and inside of yourself. What I did was, I was already at that point really interested in in, in creativity and in unpacking creativity and, and trying to understand the creative process and the creative journey. And I had been, like I said much earlier, 
uh, very, into, I, I kind of stopped playing music at that point mm-hmm. bit while I was traveling and I was really into photography and I was taking lots and lots of slides and, uh, while I was traveling and I selected some pictures that represented my, that were the kind of the best of my pictures of my journey and that represented this journey in a, in a, in a kind of a linear way for me. And I turned that into an allegorical journey, an allegorical representation of the creative process mm-hmm. of, of the, of the creative process and specifically of what I thought it was thinking about at the time as mythological storytelling, which is interesting. Cause it's kind of like, you know, Campbellian hero's yeah. journey. Cause you did go on your own hero's journey. Kind of. You did. Well, not just kind of, you transform because and let me say this folks. Um, and I'll be gentle though. He'll probably raise an eyebrow <laughs> at me before he went on this journey. Um, Tobias was a little tubby, <laughs> And he came back looking like Jesus, okay. which which is hilarious considering that you also had some spiritual leveling up yeah. that happened on that trip. I was a wraith when I came back. He came I, back, he was bearded, he was a wraith, he was, you know, you were transformed and it was just, I was a gog. I, I lost over 60 pounds. It was insane. And then... A lot of that was the dysentery. Well, of course, of course. But also you have this transformation. I'm going to like, I'm going to fast forward through some chunks because you have Passage, which some of you know ended up becoming, you know, the primary soundtrack for Broken Saints, which is kind of neat because you have the spiritual journey that someone I I admire my hero who inspired me to travel and create so much. He made this thing. I still remember sitting on the diving board at a house in North Vancouver and Lynn Valley listening to this over again and again and again after he gave me a copy. And I'm like, this has to be like a TV show or something. This has to be like a soundtrack. So I was so into Twin Peaks and similar things. I'm like, I can just see a show. And it was quite soon afterwards where Broken Saints was born, which became my big work. Um, cause I was so, this shows I was kind of slow on the curve. I was kind of like, you know, riding in your draft. If I was a cyclist <laughs> behind your truck, um, Okay, so you had your East Coast experience, your Ontario experience, uh, you know, went overseas and came back, you're in Montreal, you're, you're in this creative hotbed, you know, if, if you got, if you guys out there listening don't know, if you only think Montreal is Celine Dion or Arcade Fire, um, back then when you were there, it was a real hotbed of a music scene even then too. Yeah. Uh, it was jazz, live performance, um, one of my huge influences, Godspeed to Black Emperor, which was uh, Radiohead's favorite band after like the Benz came out, they're like the best band in the world, this massive group, and you kind of, you had a tangent relationship with them too i was living in the loft over see that's fucking amazing to me that <laughs> blows my mind stuff happening in montreal this was a great amazing place to be and for those of you listening outside of canada or even north america it's you know it's a half french essentially city it's like there's something kind of european about the culture there that's unlike anywhere else in our country and so you were exposed to that and and also you had you know budding romance everything else grow and what i'm curious about is that you had this you had this you continued on the artistic path even though you weren't making a lot of money you were, <laughs> yeah exactly like, like none uh and you made this really really personal work and invested a lot in it and you know got alliances to help you create it and support and and it didn't make a lot of money either and you're like okay so i'm gonna move to the west coast and you were uh out in vancouver where we intersected yet again years later and living a beautiful simple awesome life uh, out on vancouver island and you were like teaching piano, you were rebuilding pianos, you were making some music too, you were doing like a whole host of things, um, almost like stepping away from the world after you had had this very worldly experience and you were getting a bit more into the spiritual space and talking about what you wanted to do. And then suddenly you get offered an experience to cross the ocean. Tell me about that. Uh, it it kind of... We were, I was, tra- I was traveling with my now wife, my then girlfriend, now wife, Athanasia, and we... Who we had met in Montreal and was all part of the... Montreal. It was one of the, obviously, clearly one of the high points of your Montreal experience. You had the creative high points, but this was really you stepping into manhood in like a serious relationship and really saying, hey, let's do this journey together. Yeah, and, and meeting the person that I was pretty sure I wanted gonna to... be with, exactly. ...stick around with. And then you came out And west. we went, well, first we went traveling. Yes. First we went oh, back right. to Asia. Yes. First, we went back to Asia, and we were we went to Bali, and we went to Sulawesi, and we mm-hmm. went to you know some fairly crazy places. But we didn't have the resources to travel indefinitely, and we knew we had to go back. But we I still remember. Of, I, I have to say, I just because travel stories, and you don't hear about this often. I still remember the thing that made me fall in love with your wife in a respectful way, of course. Right. Boundaries um, was her telling me. I think one of the first times we spoke in Victoria, outside of Victoria, was her telling me the story of traveling with you and 
having <laughs> to pee. And she was in the back of the bus, and she had to piss like a motherfucker. She, there was nothing she could do. You're in a Korea. girl. You can't piss out the was in Korea, okay? In Korea. You can't piss out the window. You can't, you know, you have to piss on the floor. So she took a water bottle, and she was, like, telling the story so perfectly about she's trying to, like, dribble it in. But, of course, that tension builds, and she's starting to release into the bottle. And it was and it's pitch coming, black. And it was pitch she black. had no idea how and full it was. And she's like, it came right <laughs> up to the rim. And I just went, victory. Flawless victory. Perfect. The and bus was full of Korean businessmen and with all with their seats reclined <laughs> all the way back. So basically we had Korean businessmen's heads in our laps. With a Canadian Greek girl pissing in a water like, bottle. Down. And, yeah, it was if, quite if you can see this right now, he's taking quite a pose. You can hear the chair, but you can, she's taking quite a pose. And that's when I fell in love with her. That's when I'm like, okay, your, your wife's the shit. She's totally cool. Um, and so, you know, you're out west. I'm doing the game thing. Coming to see plays. I'm coming over to visit you. We're having some deep talks. We're like, you know, smoke a lot of weed and having that type of experience. The West oh, Coast experience. And we went out in the rowboat. Oh, we that out in the, magical. We went out in my leaky rowboat. Magical Barely night. stayed afloat. Off and, of Vancouver Island. And we were out kind of in the moon and with we were, maybe and we full were, moon. And we and, were baked. And we were definitely baked. And and we were sitting there kind of like having a philosophical, but slow, punctuated with long silences yes. because of the, the, the... It was the, the beauty around us the had to be absorbed. And then the moments just came naturally where we knew when to speak and we knew when to be silent. And then what popped up beside oh, that the robot? head of a seal. It was just... Like two feet away. Two feet away His and just... giant glass, glass eyes. eyes. And he was just watching. And he was genuinely just interested in us and stayed there for God knows minute, how long. Two uh, minutes? At least two minutes. Two to three minutes. Of course, it felt like just an hour, but really... Just looking at us. And we were like, hey. Silent. Silent. Oh, yep. Wow. And then, and then we like, hello, hello. And he just stayed and like turned his head back and forth, left and right, looking at both of us as we're just like giddy little kids. It was incredible. And then we didn't shock him. We didn't make sudden noise. He didn't freak out. It was just this slow kind of, okay, see ya. And we both looked at each other. We're like, thank you. And it was this total omen and blessing. And it was I, time for him to go. And it was time for us to get back to the dock before the boat sank. Uh, absolutely. Because we were bailing. And, uh, you know, I was going through some stuff then. And I remember having a lot of deep conversations with you then about, like, you know, kind of like the, the spiritual nature of things. And maybe things will work out. And, you know, forgiving bad stuff. And seeing the lessons and stuff. You were still, like, you know, pretty far down the path. And I was still, like, an acolyte. And I was still, like, learning. Um, but it was soon after that, relatively soon after that, that you get this job offer to come to Berlin. And you've been here how many years now? 16 years, 16 saying, years. right? 16 years. Um, talk a little bit about that because uh, I, I mentioned Berlin. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. Uh, I, I was late to really start traveling and definitely very late for the European experience when other Canadians were going off and doing the backpack through Europe thing. I couldn't afford it. Um, I did some weirder travels, you know, Fiji and this and that and Australia and New Zealand, which every Canadian does. Which and, I was in awe of. Let's uh, just that's, to... Well, that's really cool. But you were, you were living, for a guy like me who had some creative inclination, Nations. You were living the dream because you were coming to do this really cool artistic gig, which was like you know, paying you to tap into your core talents in Europe, in an amazing city in Europe. Technically, not that long after the Berlin Wall fell. It fell when you're looking at the, the, when I say technically, I yeah. mean of course, like you know, a decade. It certainly it was a decade, but it, it certainly felt very raw at yeah. the time when we got here. It felt very different than it does now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, without going down the secret law of attraction thing, we <laughs> and we wished and we hoped and we made a vision board. And we then did, we Berlin. Did not, we did not make a vision board. <laughs> what we did was we went for a walk in the woods and we were like, ah, it's kind of cool here. It's really nice, but we kind of want to travel again. But you know what? We don't want to travel in a backpack spending you know, whatever money we have and, and then ending up broke. We, I'd kind of like to travel and work and in Europe because I'd never been to Europe at hmm. that point. So I, we kind of just floated that out. We kind of just like had this conversation where we said, maybe we should do that if an opportunity arose. And then... Yeah, how long after were you offered the job? About a month. That's... About a month Fuck later, I, 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 got the, uh, I, got a, I got a call on my answering machine from an old friend who I'd played music with years and years before who said, hey, I'm uh, calling because uh, I'm in Munich and uh, I'm playing this show and maybe uh, we kind of need a piano player kind of on short notice and, and maybe you want to come and move to Munich and play the show. The money's pretty good. It's really fun. The band's great. Uh the only catch is you have to be here next week. <laughs> that was me snorting. So I so I ran away to join the circus. 
which is incredible because this this was i eventually visited uh, a few years later uh, as we were finishing off the soundtrack for the finale of broken saint but to hear these stories and again we had email then so we had regular communication they invented email i know it's amazing i only started using it around 1997 98 i was a late bloomer in almost every way um but to have this communication with you to hear how the stories were to hear what was happening for you to me it was just so incredibly exotic um because it was an offshoot essentially of like cirque du soleil right which almost everyone has heard of like plump duck was yeah it was it was being run by it was, it was run being by managed it. yeah by it. it hadn't exactly. started as a cirque show but it was being no. managed at that point and and kind of creatively directed by cirque du soleil which is pretty damn cool and it was this like incredible theater in the round dinner theater in the round really with like you know clowns and and acrobats and jugglers and opera singers and impresarios and entertainers of all stripes and musicians incredible musicians and everyone's coming out for this like fine dining meets live circus performance experience under like a technicolor big top yeah, well, they're actually they're, they're, that tent was an original Belgian mirror tent from the twenties. Oh, it was crazy! It had a lot friends. of vibe. You missed out if you didn't get to see this. It had a lot of vibe, and and an atmosphere, and it wasn't. I mean, it, it's entertainment. What I'm interested in uh, uh, now, as we're like nearing the end of at least this chat, so we can talk for the next fifteen minutes or so about this, is really the experience of being in Berlin. You, you are an expat. Who essentially, you know, and you you now have citizenship, right? Or at least you have um, permanent residence. permanent residence, exactly. And your son has he could have citizenship, but he, he also wants has to. Pers- permanent residence. Right. He's a Canadian. Okay. That, he's a Canucky that was born in Berlin and, and hasn't been to Canada. All and, and your and and your wife is Greek Canadian. She is both, correct? She is. Yeah, she has. So that's so amazing. So you have the freedom to go through Europe, and you're, you've been living in Europe now for this all this time for sixteen years, and. Um, how would you compare for a lot of our North American listeners who just don't know and have maybe been limited by their media experience or by their travel, be it like uh, going to other places or just not having the the money? To, what is it like for you living here now? And you've lived in this flat, which is a cozy little flat in the Wilmersdorf, or, yeah, yeah, in Wilmersdorf region of, of Berlin for sixteen years. Same one, and I I can understand why because I'm always cozy here. That wasn't the plan. Wasn't the plan. But what is? How would you encapsulate the Berlin experience, especially as an artist? What are I the mean, differences? I'm I'm talking like everything from like you know from from healthcare to dealing with government red tape to what people are like on the street to like okay how about this instead? I'm being way too scattered. <laughs> I'm being I'm jazzing right now. I'm totally following the jazz spirit. You're like giving it your own shit now. I'm yeah totally man. Come on, get with the get with it, chill with the jam. Um, uh, cool, daddy o. What I'm thinking is pros and cons. From from a Canadian's perspective, when a when you came here, you know. What would you do if you had to make a table and put down your pros and cons, you know, of being here in Berlin, Germany, especially at that time? Oh, I mean, the quality of life for cost of living index here is fantastic. It is really hard to beat. It still is, even now that it's a lot more expensive than it was when I came here, it's even now it's still kind of the cheapest big city in Western Europe. And in some ways, the hippest, the coolest. There's so it much very going hip. on. There's so much There's going on. So That's much the going thing. On. There couldn't be much more going on. From circus to like in the summer where they bring in sand to make beach parties all over the city beach to indoor and outdoor concerts. I still remember the one. Incredible classical music. Oh, jeez. Unbelievable. And not just that, but like, again, more stuff along the lines of what you do. The, the live performance that's just like avant-garde and intense and funny and sexy and dangerous. You can find anything. I still remember. I flash back I do to that. I, I know this. I've heard about these clubs, but getting aside from that stuff, the stuff that we expect, the stuff that Conan O'Brien will show you in, in, you know, in his sessions, I still remember being blown away, uh, not by the nude beaches. That still terrified me, and we'll talk about that story another day. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, uh, the place out in East Berlin, or no, East Germany, when we went out to the spa. That was still, that's a story I'm going to do I'm on sorry. my own podcast. No, no, that's all his fault. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, see, that's hooking you for later. You're invested, bitches. Um, but what I was, I was really intrigued by was it, it was that first summer I came here. And this was 2003. It was June. It was around my birthday. And we came to work on the finale music for Saints. Oh, yeah. And you took me downtown. 
done. It was right into the hip region. Into, yeah, yeah, exactly. And we went into um, we went into like you know the eastern part of the town. We crossed the border, went to the eastern part of the town, the cobblestone area of town. It was all like these cool kind of artist setups and you know Czechoslovakian hookers and like whatever else was going on. It was all this stuff happening. Strange but then, metal shops. The strange metal shops, exactly. With the weird metal bull, I remember that thing. Yeah. But we went into this like little church late at night and we watched. A circus show it was like you said this is like for adults it's x-rated it's uh you know an over-the-top kind of like heavy metal circus it was trapeze and circus it was trapeze and i don't know if you remember it but it blew my mind i'm like here i am in this city and it was like a thursday <laughs> it was a thursday in the summer and he's like oh come down we're gonna see this a couple of my friends are in this and don your your scottish yeah. fellow who did his thing uh, he's like oh you got to see this it's amazing and we went in and there's a little lineup and we went to this like church at midnight when the show started and walked back in this darkened room with candles and there was like the the clownish fool introducing everything and deutsch and deutsch and deutsch and whatever da, 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 da. then all of a sudden there are these like hot suicide girly looking ah, tattooed yeah. chicks this was swinging. a chameleon midnight show oh, Oh, this is what blew you're talking my about. mind. This stuff does not happen in North America. And There's think, punk circus here. It's true. It's it's and this is this is the thing. Okay, so you're talking about quality of life. You're talking about uh, access to things happening everywhere. The food quality is great because Germany is really strict with its standards. Um, okay, these are a lot of the pros. Uh, and the city set up beautifully, and it's clean, and it's you know vibrant and modern and all that stuff. What are some of the cons? I'm curious from your perspective. I uh, I don't love doing my, my taxes here. <laughs> it's a lot of red tape. Okay, so you got the There's red tape. There's a bureaucracy factor. Crazy bureaucracy. And you're like, well, it's Germany. You would There's expect those... it. No, you forgot to fill out this form and go home and come back in three months. No, you did it wrong again. <laughs> it's never going to be right. It's never, you'll never be right. Um, okay, learning okay, I, learning I, language, of course, but and your, your wife's excellent. Uh, she's better solid. than I am, that's yeah, for sure. You're functional. Not saying much. Um, but what about, okay. Just from a social aspect, obviously you have your peers that you work with and a lot of them speak English and, and you have a connection with them. And also the language of being a musician and being a jazz musician, no less, and working in circus, you have those bonds. But being just out in the world, is it, do you find it, is it warm? Is it friendly? Is it chilly? Is it challenging? Is it uh, a place where people can easily come? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty used to it now. I mean, Berlin is a, an extremely cosmopolitan place at this point. Uh, there are days when I walk down the street and I'm like, is there anybody speaking German here anymore? I don't know. I, I, I like everyone's it's international. It's a very international. It's the way I felt the first time I went to London, which was actually when we met up those few years later, uh, being in London and just going every street corner had a different language being yeah. spoken. It's yeah. truly cosmopolitan. It's, that way. it's really that has that's been a change since we've been here i mean it was the germ of it was happening then but now it's it's really flourished it's, uh, there's there's a lot of so if you want i mean there i know people who have lived here for years and years and speak no german because you don't have to and it's it's certainly possible it's to to, to, to stick to your own little i mean i have very functional shop german and restaurant german and transit german and, and where's the bathroom and, german which is it, essential yeah <laughs> in a pinch bureaucracy german because you have to get you have to navigate it mm -hmm. uh but conversationally it's limited and and that's my own failing and my own laziness and it, it's the, the laziness that comes with being an english native speaker where you everybody else speaks enough english that you can get by and you don't well, have to. And, but here's, okay, so then with that laziness uh, uh, intact and in effect uh, in this conversation and with your, your past, your Canadian experience with that middle road when you were transforming and traveling and with your present and all the stuff you've worked on and moving forward and you're a father with a 10-year-old son and you guys have been here for like all this time. What I am definitely curious about, what I think a lot of the listeners would be curious about uh, at this point, politically, with the changes happening in the world very, very quickly, oh God. with with um, with currencies fluctuating, with you know uh, sabers rattling and the war drums banging in places, with Trump obviously, but less him. I hate giving him too much credit. Just with like these weird, malignant, rebellious forces hey, man, of the far right. With, Turkey and, now. Well, that's the thing. And, and in Europe in general, right? Look at Hungary. Look at a few other places where it's just swung crazy into fascism. Fingers crossed for Netherlands. Well, yeah. And, and this is the thing that you had mentioned to me last summer that you were worried about here because there is a contingent of far right that's kind of trying to rise up here and has some populist support. Um, Absolutely. What, what are your biggest concerns? And, and, and add to that, of course, the immigrant crisis not just from Syria, but from surrounding nations, because I was just down in Greece, and of course yeah. it was not just Syrians, but a lot of Pakistanis and others who are like fleeing the Middle East. 
you know, coming through Turkey and then hopping into Greece or Italy. And all of them say that their dream is Germany. Uh, for the social support network, obviously, but you know, you've been hearing you've it's, been hearing the stories it's about the economic oh, battery of Europe is exactly. the wealthy place, and it's been welcoming. Mm-hmm. And it's been by and large, despite everything else, despite a minority basically saying keep them out, we Absolutely. want their old ways, whatever else, or spinning the stories of oh, all the men come and they're just either trying to kill us as terrorists or molest our women. The majority of people coming here are definitely thankful to be here. Uh, it seems like, and it seems like people here are pretty welcoming from what I've heard. I've taken enough taxis. I've talked to enough people on street corners or at airports and they're like, we want to help. You could fixate on the stories of people throwing Molotov cocktails through the windows of the refugee centers, or you can fixate on the extraordinary stories of people opening their homes, opening their lives and engaging. And it's... Well, you're both. Both of those things are here. And your wife, Athanasia, she's worked with refugees. She works every week. She goes down to the center. I, I mean, I've, I've done my little things there, but she's much more engaged and involved than I am. She's had more time. Mm-hmm. Right? That's so, the reality. But she's very involved. And it's just down the street. I mean, there's like a thousand people living in an old uh, former government office building thousand meters or less than 500 meters that way well we all have okay so it's easy to say what's your biggest hope because we all have hopes for some sort of utopian future you know guaranteed minimum wage blah 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 blah, blah. everyone's fed everyone's happy and just pursuing what they want to pursue that's great that that we'd love that to happen basic income yeah right exactly on. basic income would be wonderful but what is your with the current way the world's shaken out living here specifically what is your biggest fear not saying, oh, I worry that the states will do something that may not affect here, but will cause this and this. Like, global worries are understandable, but I'm saying living in Berlin as a Canadian, what is your biggest concern? The biggest fear is that what happened in the states happens here. The swing to the far right. Yeah. And, or and, populist but it rise. Starts with, it starts with the reactionary media. It starts with this right-wing media of fear. Mm-hmm. And ramping that up because it's, you know, the only way to get more, more listenership is to is ramp the fear up, make right. more and more and more fear. And once you start down that path, there's no end if you want to. Uh, and that's, it's a monster that you, it's, it's Frankenstein's monster. You create that monster. What do you do with it? Mm-hmm. it it's not going to go away. So it's happening here. There are those factors here. It's a lot less than it is in, in the States. It's a lot less than it is in many places. I I feel like there's this ever-present warning here mm-hmm. of what happened because it happened here. Yes, and it was it was the same thing, pretty much. We don't want to talk it was an about earlier it. time. It was it, it we was a talk different about form. It, but the rise, but the, the rise of fascism across Europe has always been the was, lookout. It was very carefully created propaganda of of, of nurturing fear, nurturing create external blame. enemies, create external enemies, create external enemies, which we're seeing happening around the world right now. There's and then hold up the exactly. the image of uh, the the mirage the scary of, of an easy an easy answer. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if we like attack them and cut if off, we could only get rid of them. Exactly, then we'll be fine. Um, and I can understand why that would be a fear here specifically. It's... And and what's interesting is you see the younger generations of Germans going, "We are not that." And I think it's part of the reason that inspires them to be so embracing of others. Uh, it, but that's as a majority, danger. that's the danger. If that's you disconnect also... from that, if you yeah. if you if, if the younger generation here says we're not, we're disconnected from that, that could never happen because we're different than mm-hmm. that. That's if exactly you forget the past, how it happens. If you forget the past, you're doomed to repeat it. Of course. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So that's, that's the, that's the grounded, functional, rational, political fear of being here. So on the positive side, by staying in Europe, by staying here, because from our private talks, you, you probably are not going to be going back to Canuckian shores anytime soon. Well, um, so we've been here for 16 years and every, nice. we've always assumed that we would be going back soon at some point, but you still, but the, I see the spark in your eyes. I see the people that you work with have seen your shows, by the way, you should come to town and come see your shows <laughs> in the show season because they're really good. And, and when he starts to, when he starts taking his trio again and doing uh, stillness shows, um, do, do those too. come, Come here. Come to Berlin and see Tobias's shows. And he'll take you out for lunch. It'll be wonderful. We'll have really good beer because he loves his beer. Uh, what are we this drinking beer. right now? Sturtebecker. Sturtebecker. Um, and I'm getting a little slurry. So I think that the last little bit here I want to look at is for the future. Coming full circle and talking about creativity. So um, in our private conversations, again, you have 
gotten into this creative cycle of you know doing shows, other people's stuff, uh, a mix of original work and covers of of playing and composing and music directing and all this different stuff. And then in your downtime from the shows, your off season, which is like six, seven months, whatever off, um, you'll work on your own stuff. Uh, but as we are becoming slowly more and more long in the tooth, uh, <laughs> he's like, hmm, smirk. Okay, he looks younger than me, at least in his eyes. It's not fair. Um, what do you hope for moving forward creatively? Uh, you started when you were very, very young. The piano drew you. It was this gravitational force you couldn't resist. Uh, you were brave. You learned. You opened up. You wanted to understand, and and you surrendered to it, and were in this crazy chaos theory of jazz, and it built to you all those electrons and all those particles flung off, and quantum theory brought them back together somehow and coalesced in this moment with you here and all the stuff you have made. If you had a couple of dreams to come true with your creative timeline moving forward while you're still in Europe. What are some of the things that you would like to do? Because, hey, you manifested coming over here. Well, mm. no, we'd like to travel, but yeah. not so much the backpack <laughs> anymore. Maybe Flashpacker, which is the new hip term, but not Backpacker. And maybe Europe would be nice because I haven't been there before. I'm not saying your voice was just like this, but it could have been. <laughs> it's like our dog voice. Someday you'll find <laughs> it. The <laughs> rainbow connection. <laughs> Lovers. Dreamers and Tobias. Uh, so, <laughs> well, so what? Uh, what we've the thing that we've left the the little piece of the puzzle that we've left out mm -hmm. is what happened after I studied uh, well, while I was studying in McGill. In McGill, and I was hardcore. I was playing very competitively and trying to be become a young jazz lion, and had this image of myself of what what I wanted to do. You know to to be take my place in this in this jazz world as a as a piano player i since i'd grown up in a small town and had had a small town piano player a piano teacher mm -hmm. i had never really learned proper technique and i was practicing 8 hours a day intensely furiously competitively and as a result of that i was shut down. I developed very, very serious uh, tendonitis, mm -hmm. carpal tunnel syndrome. Which I, I'm starting to feel now just from typing. Yeah. Well, imagine practicing piano. Eight I hours can't even. Shitty can't, technique. I can't even imagine. You'll have to tell me healing techniques after the podcast. <laughs> so I had this crash where I went from one week, I was, you know, doing Oscar Peterson transcriptions. And then I couldn't lift up a coffee cup without pain. I couldn't play anything. I couldn't, I had to stop. I had to take months and months off. I had to find a teacher who had been through this and who could help me. And, and I went, the next thing was like rebuilding, breaking down and rebuilding piano technique and, and playing really slow C major scales mm -hmm. and learning and trying to figure out how to do this without pain. Without pain. And that has been a very long journey. And at the time I made this decision, I was like, okay, I'm, I guess I'm not meant to be a performer. I'm meant to be a composer or something else. And I took down some projects off the shelf. My electronic music composition world came down off the shelf. Mm -hmm. My intellectual musicology world came down off the shelf and I delved into that for a long time. And then somehow in the interim, I've made my living almost exclusively playing the piano. Right. Which was not expected, but it just kind of happened. I found a way. I've I found the healing that I needed. And now what I want to do is bring the piano back into my creative world. I've done a lot of electronic music over the years. I've done a lot of with, with Broken Saints soundtrack, mm -hmm. with the Sound Fascination stuff, with the Catch Mouth soundtrack. There's been a lot of electronics. I don't want to lose that. I've had a wonderful time with electronic music since I discovered it when I was 16, really, with Switched on Bach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. And uh, and Vangelis and Guitaro. Oh, there and, we go. Yeah. Oh, Guitaro. That's so cool. I remember thinking about him the other day, but uh, Vangelis and also with the new Blade Runner coming up and yeah. how they're trying to mirror right. that soundtrack. It's a space where I've always known you. And we're, we've be been in. talking about yes. this over the last few days yes. about the projects that we're talking about doing now with mm -hmm. this resurrection of, of 80s electronica and and, mm -hmm. how, and, 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 and how and how evocative that can be and how compelling that can be when it's done properly with a certain degree of reverence and understanding of why it worked. Yeah. Not just, okay, I'm I'm going to make my synthesizer play this type of sound. Yeah. It's about 
what's the, the thing about that sound that makes yeah, it work? what does it evoke? Exactly. But I've realized that, you know, since four years old, when my mother plopped me down on the piano stool and on the piano bench and said, here's the piano, it needs to have to do with the piano. It's everything that I do from now on kind of has to include that. Well, do you know what's beautiful? And this is what we're going to end off on. Uh, it all comes back to the piano for you. That was kind of your big bang moment. Uh, but as with your book that you were working on, which we can talk about another time, but with your book, um, piano and knowing how to play is all about uh, the left hand and the right hand working in synchronicity. And the left brain and the right brain. It, it, that's the thing. This is the thing coming back to your influences when you were young and you had a left brain influence in, in, with your father and science and, and, and logic and discipline and understanding things and being reductionist and looking at it through a microscope and getting it and then being macro on it. And you had a, such a beautiful right brain influence from your artistic mother who helped you just like surrender into the experience of something to explore and to see how connections worked and what felt good. And so I want to say thank you for that influence on me. Uh, to understand why that works and how I can maybe tap into it, it, it within myself in a better way. And I hope that some of you listening out there who have artistic inclinations um, can take something from this conversation as well, because uh, good art is not purely just uh, a right brain experience. You don't just make what you want and let it go. Well, you can. You can do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> um, but for me, the reason why I admire the man sitting across from me so much is because of that balance. I think the best work comes from the people who can balance within themselves those forces of focus and discipline and understanding along with surrender and fearlessness and if anybody i know embodies that and a love of beer uh it would be uh tobias so thank you so much for the time today again you want to go to tobias tinker Dot com. Yes, it's spelled as it sounds. Um, you can also check out my site, brookburgess.com. It's Brooke with an E on the end and Burgess as in Burgess Meredith. Come on, Rock. We got to beat him, Rock. And uh, and you'll be able to find the Cat's Maw, which we worked on. I think instead of playing a, a piece from uh, uh, the Cat's Maw that we did together, uh, which is more driven by by vocals, he had spoken how important piano was to him. So we're going to sign off with, uh, with the podcast jingle and then go into a, a solo piano piece um, by... Tobias Tinker. Thank you so much for your time. Coming back soon to you. Buddha and the slut. Peace. Next time we'll do something sexy.